Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the Trinity Continuum rules by Onyx Path Publishing. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes and various hijinks. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. And now, on with the show. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am normally your keeper or handler, Michael Diamond. Uh, but tonight, we're going to be playing in the Trinity Continuum. Specifically, we're going to be kicking off our Aberrant game. And so to do that, I'm going to hand it to James. James, take it away. Thank you, guys. And welcome to our first uh, inaugural Aberrant game. I'm looking forward to getting this underway. But first, we need to know who is rolling at the table. And so to my proverbial right. Hi, this is Jake. I'll be playing Granite, a uh, combat specialist. Awesome. I like that name. Next to Jake. Hi, this is Miranda, and I'll be playing Trist Waring, the hopeful young athlete of the group. I can hear the crowds roaring now. And next to Miranda. This is Morgan. I'll be playing Riley Kennedy. I am also a combat specialist. And in a very nearby dimension, we have, lastly but not leastly, yeah, hi, this is Mike. I'll be playing Patrick Graves, who is a member of the Wonder Guard and a bit of a celebrity. Wonder Guard. Ooh. We're going to hear more about them in just a little bit. But first, Trist, you are standing on rubber-covered asphalt. Your track shoes are tight on your feet. The air is warm. It's mid-June. The air is a little sticky, and it's the sound of pretty much everyone you've met over the last year and a half is rushing over you in waves, cheering, hollering, encouragement. You look around as you see your coach approaching you across the tarmac as you're loosening up. He comes up to you. He's wearing a wearing like a t-shirt that has the university, the NYU university logo on it. I kid. So you tell me. You got this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, coach. I know I got it. You, you know you can count on me. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to run fast. I ain't, I ain't stopping for anything, coach. I ain't stopping. Good. That's what I want to hear. All right. He kind of, he crouches down a little bit as you're stretching your hamstrings and says, all right. No, just like we practiced, your feet down, knuckles down. You don't stop pushing until you cross that line. Got it? Yeah, coach, you got it. You you can count on me, coach. All right. He backs away and he gives you a nod and steps over to the side where the coaches stand. The audience doesn't fall completely silent, but it hushes a little bit in anticipation of watching you tackle this track. Six other competitors line up. You eye them. There's a couple on your left, a couple on your right. It's good to have someone to run against. If you're running alone on the track, it got a little boring. And it's the part of the competition is part of it. Yeah, just like uh, like like before any other race, Trist is kind of nervously uh, is shaking out the jitters uh, before she gets into the, the starting blocks. Okay. So, yep, uh, you shake it off a little bit. You, you've got a, a little bit of a sensation of butterflies which is not unusual you feel your muscles tingle in the backs of your legs and down your spine and back your calves you feel kind of a, a, a cold sweat wash over you you assume it's probably going to be nerves because you're now running in front of not only the entire crowd your coach but you're fairly soon your coach is talking to a couple of guys with suits and clipboards that seem to be taking a special interest in how fast you are slated to go tonight. That could be pretty lucrative. We're talking sports contracts. Yeah, yeah, this is this is a big one too. I'd I'd also look out into the crowd to see if uh, you know, see if my first coach, my dad, dad is there, and and mom too in the crowd. Look for kind of where they usually usually sit. Yep, 
they're not too far from your other coach. Uh, they're up in the crowds, just up and to the left a little bit. Your mom, she's sitting and watching you through a little pair of those binoculars that are entirely unnecessary at the distance that they are sitting at. And your dad is grinning like a fool and waving at you. And uh, occasionally throws a, a snide comment over the shoulder to the people, the parents behind him, like, you know, that's my kid. You can each, you can kind of hear it, even though their the audience is completely drowning it out. Yeah, I, kinda, I wave back, you know, and uh, give him a thumbs up, hold up like the number one finger because uh, he knows I'm going to go all the way. Very, very confident. Yep. So the time has come. You put your feet against the blocks and you brace, as you said, knuckle down. You feel the texture of the asphalt and you hear a gunshot. And the world around you drops away and becomes sparkles and drifts of color for just a split second. You're moving. You feel your legs pushing you forward. You are just giving it your all. You know that you are really, you're showing them something right now. There's this bizarre strobe effect as you look over at the crowd as you run by and you start to feel very dizzy for a moment. Are you going to keep pushing through? Or are you going to are you going to stop? Yeah, no, this this happens. I you you got to push through. You you got to push through. You got to push through this. I'm doing this for me, doing this for my parents, doing it for coach. All right. So rather than slow down or give in like, you know, quitters do, you dig your toes into the into the turf and you push just a, just a little harder. You push with something that you didn't know was there and you feel something inside of you change. It feels like that cold wash that went over you on the outside now blooms from the inside, from, from like your spine outward up into your brain. It doesn't slow you down. In fact, it makes the world tilt just a little as you figure out that you could go a little faster. In fact, whatever that is, it, you could push a little harder. You could show them a little more. Oh, yeah. It, if I feel like there's a spot deeper that I can can dig, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show off. This is, this is my moment. You start to show off. You dig as deep as you can. You really give it everything. You're going to get those sports contracts. You're going to get the sponsorships. You're going to go to the Olympics because no one out here is as fast as you are. And that's when you hear it. It sounds like a rifle shot, only louder, like a hundred times louder. Involuntarily, your hands go up to your ears as the runners next to you, ahead of you, behind you, you're having a hard time placing where they're at, fly away from you like leaves in the wind. They literally tumble away from you like balls of crumpled up paper bouncing off of walls and out into the crowd. And the track is gone. It's now dark. The air's not as warm. It's a little chilly. You're now in a forest on a, a path, uh, like a paved path in what looks like maybe a national park or a forest of some sort. Is this place familiar at all? Like, have I been here before? Well, you squint in the dark for a moment, and it looks vaguely familiar like maybe you went camping here with your family when you were younger or perhaps you've gone running here before hmm. strange so you turn back towards away from the way you were currently pointed and you see a glow off not quite on the horizon but quite a ways off in the distance looks like the college over there and the city um I uh, I think I'd be i really confused and disoriented, so I'd, I'd probably head in in that direction. But try to find the first other person, very disoriented and confused. Okay, you walk for a good ten, fifteen minutes, and you finally come to a main road that is the exit to the park, right at the exit of the park, and parked at the exit. Right inside of the park is a state trooper. When you walk out of the woods, he turns his car light on you, like the spotlight, so it blinds you almost instantly. Yeah. 
put my hands up. You hear a car door open. Mind telling me what you're doing out here? I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't know, Coach. I was just at the. I was at a meet and at the u- university, and and now I'm here. I, I don't know if I blacked out or, or what happened. What time is it? He says it's. I don't know about eight fifteen. He says, "Ma'am, I, huh? Um, ma'am, were you were you, were you in the explosion? I I'm I might have been. There's I I remember people f- flying away from me." There was an explosion at the university tonight. Something, some sort of an attack on a on a track meet just happened. Went out over the radio. Did you did you well, fly I, out here from an explosion? How is that even possible? He tilts his head back. He turns the light away from you. Well, I don't know. Maybe I got disoriented. Maybe I got turned around. Can you can you give me a ride back there? My my parents were there, and I coached my whole team's there. Sure, sure. I, I can. Uh, oh, um, he steps around the front of the car and he pauses when he sees you now, with the light turned away from you a little. He says, I, I actually, um, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you a ride, okay? You, you, you just stay right here. I'm gonna call you a ride, okay? Okay, yeah. He gets back into the car and, without preamble, he starts his car and drives away. What a jerk! I'll return to you in a moment. Wonder Guard Agent Graves, tonight is your first big night. This is your first night with your own Wonder Guard task force. Wonder Guard has had an amazing tradition over the last 70 or so years of protecting people. Guard actually stands for Genetically Aberrant Research Division, although it, people hardly ever use that actual term now. It's Wonder Guard, you're Everyone knows about Wonder Guard. There are websites, there are apps tracking where you guys are. There are people who have gone on to be seven and eight figure celebrities from being in Wonder Guard. Not to mention the big game, one of the big teams. But that's not why you're here. That's not why you do what you do. You enter the login and training facility in New York. It's in the Corona Flushing District, not far from Queens. The place is a hubbub. This facility is one of the oldest, built in the 70s to help the first wave of people that inexplicably started to show strange abilities, abilities above and beyond the norm, things that humans could do. A lot of the early generation you know, as you walk through the building, you see pictures of some of the first agents, some of the first Wonder Guard that went on record as being available to not just the wonders who are emerging, who are scared, who are, let's face it, dangerous, but also to the the baselines that are not, they don't have powers and they don't have anyone to protect them from scared people who do. And that's where your job has come in with Wonder Guard and your newly formed task force. You get to your locker, you put your equipment away, a vest made of uh, Trilar, a new kind of polymer Kevlar created over the last couple of years. You close your locker and look about. The office is a hubbub, always things to be done. It's not your first time in a Wonder Guard office, for sure. It's a large multi-floor building. Some is administration, some is dispatch and some is transfer. There's very little holding here. Holding is usually done in safer facilities, other places, and there's no imprisonment. There's just rehabilitation. How many people do I figure are here? In this building, in this Wonder Guard facility, probably 350 people. Are they all special or are they administrative baselines that a lot of them are administrative baselines. Um, a lot of them are what are known as um, baseline liaisons, which are people who seem to have not exactly a level of a, a, a wonder level of ability, but there's something about them that seems to put them above other people. Not that they're better, but just that they're they excel in certain areas. Wonder Guard looks for the best. Any even a possibility of a person being a wonder, they'll give them a job if they seem to be useful. 
There's no shortage of work, especially in the New York facilities. And then, of course, there are wonders. There's on staff right now about 35 wonders that you know of, of various levels and magnitudes. There are no building topplers here, although there's a couple of people who might be able to topple a building if they really gave it their all, but there's no ultraviolet class. Okay. That's probably good for everybody. You yourself, you think back to your training as you are going to head to your uh, administrator's office to get your assignment. First time, you will admit you have a little bit of butterflies in your stomach because while you have been on a task force before and you have seen some shit, this is the first time that you are holding the keys, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. I've had an opportunity to obviously be on a couple of different operations at this point. You know, the guard has put me to use, obviously given my abilities, likely a few times, especially when it comes to, well, we'll just say um, newer members, <laughs> sort of that um, seek and contain specialist. Uh, but yeah, but heading up a team is a totally different situation. In the locker room and trading facilities, you have gotten the nickname The Fort. Mm. And you get a couple high fives on your way by of, of people that you have trained with, people you've gone on missions with. Hey, Graves, good job. You going to do it out there? <laughs> yeah. You see uh, an officer, Johansson, steps out. He's a wonder who works closely with the New York Police Department as the Wonder Guard liaison. He himself is not a police officer, but the police do have to utilize your services, mm. especially in the New York area, quite often. It's an unfortunate truth, and it does cause some controversy, but they are not equipped to handle a scared wonder. Yeah. Or, worst case scenario, a terror. Yeah, no, I'm sure that everybody understands that, you know, the guard can't supplant, you know, the locals. That's something, you know, that we don't want to turn ourselves into a military force. You have had literal, you had an entire class about the sticky PR situation of the world right now. Johansson steps out and he knuckle bumps you. Hey. Hey, Graves. What are we doing? Oh, not too bad. I'm I'm up to my eyeballs in the, the four coming back. But uh, I tell you, they <laughs> it's like working with adult kids. I, I wish I could see the world through their eyes. That's amazing. You know he's referencing the recent reappearance of the four missing people that disappeared in 1939 often suspected to be the first release of the radiation that has started to cause wonders to appear in the world, or these genetic aberrants, as they're called sometimes in the media. Although a lot of people find that to be a fairly distasteful term. Yeah, it's probably something that, um, while not, you know, probably not flagged by uh, every news agency in the world, I'm sure there's some over-hyper- focused marketing agencies that refuse to use it. Yep. Just like a lot of terms, uh, good and bad, there's some there's some delicacy that has to be handled in today's in your work today. He says, yeah, they're, they're really interesting. I tell you, I've never seen people's brains that work the way theirs do. I wish I could see inside of them, but anyway, so I hear you have a new mission. He has fallen in the step beside you as you're walking. He's not keeping you. He's holding a cup of what you assume is coffee. I kind of envy you being able to go out in the field, though, and, and like, work with, you know, people. I deal with a lot of fear. <laughs> There's going to be ups and downs to the task force and to this group, I'm sure. But part of making sure that baselines are safe means that we need to find those who are going through these changes and make sure that they understand that, you know, life for them has changed in a way that, it hasn't for a lot of people. I agree. I mean, mine was, <laughs> I don't want to say traumatic, but it was, I mean, because there are people out there that we've dealt with, you know what I mean, way worse than than, than I've had it, but still. I mean, I was, gr I was ground zero at a terrorist attack when a bomb went off and I didn't die. He says, uh, hey, I don't mean to, I don't mean to keep you, your, your, uh, your rookies are in, <laughs> your rookies are in the office there, the uh, chief, all right? Yeah. Say, have a good day. If you need anything, man, you call me, all right? I will. Stay safe. Yeah, you too, man. He turns and he kind of jogs off. And he's like, hey, 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 Wilkins. He's talking to somebody else already. 
guy never gets to work because he's always passing himself around as a water cooler. I, yep. I head into the office where the chief is. He's uh, sitting at a desk. Uh, well, actually, he's kind of reclining against the corner of the desk, looking at a file. There are three people currently sitting in chairs on the left side of the office as you walk in. Each has a duffel bag next to them. Okay. He looks up from his folder. Middle-aged man, slightly heavier set. His fists are, from his fingertips to his elbows, are a rust color. And you could, they leave what looks like rusted metal on the folder that he's holding. And when he opens his hand, you hear a very faint creak sound. He hands the folder to you. Ah, Graves, how you doing? Good. Come on in. He sits down in his desk. The chair is built very robustly. It's a very heavy set chair and it still groans a little as he sits down in it. So I, uh, I look at the folder and take a peek. It's got three files. It's a Riley Kennedy, a Daniel Kowalski, and an Andrew Miller. Okay. Where are they at? He points kind of offhandedly to the three people that are sitting in the office there. He's like, just because they're rookies doesn't mean you can't see them. Remember, that doesn't happen until week two. Right, right. I shut the folder. <laughs> I'll step over to uh, the group of them. What time of day is it, James? It is about 7.45. You go on shift at about 8 o'clock p.m. Evening. Morgan and Jake, describe yourselves, please. Keeping in mind that they are both wearing Wonder Guard t-shirts and company issue pants and shoes. Dark haired, big guy, about 6'3", kind of, I, I, I'd say stocky if he was shorter, but he's just thick. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you, and you, Morgan? When Graves comes over, assume him to be our commanding officer for, for team lead. I immediately stand up at attention, you know, like raised in the military, former military. Riley stands probably about 5'8". Um, she is wearing, besides the, the Wonder Guard team outfit of slacks and a shirt, she's wearing long black gloves to cover her hands. And um, she's slender, but athletic looking. Um, so not too skinny. <laughs> and she's got long, dark hair that's really pulled up in a tight bun and uh, dark eyes. Okay. Yeah, I would say Graves is probably 5'10", 5'11". He's, he likely looks like he's no more than 170 pounds, maybe. He doesn't look exceedingly well built. In, in fact, he doesn't really look special at all physically. He looks like a regular, everyday dude. Except you already know Patrick Graves. Because inside the community, he has fame. You've seen him on television. You have seen him on the internet. You've seen, likely seen how his powers work because you've seen them. They've been on camera. And he's sort of a specialist that is put into dangerous situations to try to absorb the powers of others to tamp them down and to calm people down. He specializes in newly erupted wonders who are wreaking havoc. You all, you'd also know that he's a flyer, and I kind of probably fashion him a little bit after Andrew Garfield, just in some of the mannerisms. He's a little, you know. Do either of you watch late night television? Yeah, all the time. If either of you watch trashy late night television, both of you have seen Patrick Graves appear very briefly on WTMZ, which is the offshoot show of TMZ, which is devoted almost entirely to wonders and terrors showing up in the media. And it's essentially like paparazzi plus not only do they want to see what you're doing, but they also want to see you use your powers because power shots are money shots as far as the media is concerned. And who doesn't love a good money shot? All right. Yeah. So he, I see him coming over and I'm like, I'm fangirling on the inside. <laughs> so the third guy that's sitting next to the two of you, Riley and Daniel. He's probably about 5'2". He's wearing dark goggles that completely cover his eyes. He's got a very odd grin on his face. It's hard to tell if he's 
enjoying himself or if he's feeling anxious because you can't see his eyes or eyebrows because the the goggles are very large and bug-eyed. Other than that, he's a very small, very wild-haired individual. He waves at you. Sorry, I'm uh, I'm Andrew. Hi, Andrew. I'm Patrick. Uh, I I know I I've met we've I'm, okay no we haven't met I've seen you before. He kind of looks away like like he's embarrassed. Shit. Oh hey, there's no problem, man. It's uh, you're new. It's okay. People are new. It happens. Welcome to the team. Thanks. They uh I'm, they call me Viewmaster. Oh, why did they call you that? He stands up and it. Ad- Adjusts his goggles a little bit. I can see things. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see stuff real well. And uh, apparently I've been slated to work with you guys. Cool. Yeah, everybody's got something special about them. Let's uh, let's see how we can put it all to use. Kowalski, is it? Yep. My name's Daniel Kowalski. What do you do, Daniel? I turn the rock. Okay. I can see where that could be uh, helpful. Is that is that it? You just turn the rock? Oh, I guess I'm strong and I could take a hit. Hmm. Good. That could exceedingly be useful. How are you as far as your temperament? Well, it takes a lot for me to get uh, all worked up. That is a huge advantage. One of the things that we're going to deal with a lot are new wonders. And they're going to be scared. They might be upset. They might be terrified. They might be angry. A lot of people, when they get their powers, it's the last thing in their life that they wanted. So it's important that when they when they consider reaching out with their powers, we don't take it personally. Yeah, I just want to help. Great. And uh, Riley, sort of, you see, you see him look through the paperwork. Sorry, what was your last name? Yes. Kennedy. Kennedy. Okay. Uh, Kennedy. What do you do that you... That makes you wonderful. Oh, I, I, I don't know if it's wonderful, sir. Um, but um, I, I can, I can, I can shoot ice. Okay, so you can manipulate elements, that being ice or water. Yes. Um, particularly um, when I get stressed out, it's more ice. I, I'm still learning to control my powers. Right. Okay. I like glance back at the chief just for a second. I, I, I had an incident in the military. I, I it, it was a very hard, it was very hard. I'm, I'm, I, I'm seeing a doctor for it. Chief looks at you and looks at Riley. You're in good hands. Don't worry about it. Oh yes, yes. I, I, I've seen, I've seen Mr. Graves out in action. I, 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 I think it'll be fine. She's a little fidgety, but you know. And what was your code name? Uh, Riley doesn't have a code name. Riley hasn't given herself a code name. I figure it would be on the job. I, I would decide on the job after we see how I perform. Okay. I mean, some people might refer to me as the ice queen. <laughs> I snort. The ice queen, huh? Okay. You know full well, Pat, that if wonders don't choose a decent code name before they're seen by the public, that quite often the code name will be chosen for them and they are far less kind so you uh, you know that the let's see how we do on the stage is something that is used quite often, but you know that the clock is, as it were, ticking and and it kind of raises a wry smile. Yeah, so uh, I had I had a wonder that I worked with when I first came on and uh, the media had given him a name and they called him the Natty Dread. And I sort of put this dark glower to my voice and it was because he used to wear his hair in dreadlocks and he called himself the natural which is the name that he wanted to go by he was a bit of a shapeshifter and he called himself the natural because he didn't believe in wearing any clothing and so the wonder guard was happy to provide him u fiber that he could properly cover himself in without feeling like it was something that was unnatural but um he got a bad name and it stuck And when a name sticks in the media, it's real tough to get it off. In fact, uh, he eventually had to go through a bit of a PR situation to remold himself. It's like, well, it's like, it's like a wrestling drama sometimes. So just don't mention the whole ice queen bit. I'm sure 
that will get you something figured out. Well, well, if I need a name, we could just go by Frostbite or Popsicle. Not Popsicle. I put my hand up. No, 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 no. There was a guy in Jersey who went by Popsicle. You don't want to be associated. Trust me. Well, let, um, how about how about Frostbite? Chief shrugs. I'll have to run it through legal. We'll call it a task force name for now. It, it won't be registered yet. Thanks, Chief. Keep your mind open because it's probably taken. Probably. You know what, though? How do you feel about chili? Like the food? I love chili. Right, but more like chili conditions. Oh, well, I do cause that with my hands. Or you keep things cool, which is exactly the point of this task force. Oh, that's... And this is why you are team lead and I am under you. Okay, so what do we got tonight? Are we just... uh, I turned to the chief. Are we just walking around or are we doing something? It's been pretty quiet, so I assume you guys would have some time to get used to the facility. You could show them around a little bit. Maybe show them the break room, not that they're going to spend much time there, <laughs> uh, before you uh, take them out for the for the big show. And uh, he's looking through papers when the door opens with some force, and one of the administrator liaisons comes in. He's in a He's sweating and he looks a little flushed. Chief, uh, you, uh, you're you going to want to see this. And he goes over to a screen on the chief's wall and he taps his phone in his hand as the screen activates with a video. It looks like some sort of track meet. He says, this, this just happened just a few minutes ago. I lean in. This is taken from the point of view of someone's phone. As you see someone recording from the from the audience. It looks like a young woman kneels down, knuckles down to begin running. There's a gunshot and she does one lap and then she does two laps and she does three laps. And as she's running, she's accelerating the whole time and she's starting to blur. And there are these green hue and streaks of green, um, not exactly lightning, but there's definitely some sort of energy emanating. And then There is a a boom that is so loud that the phone filter, the phone auto filters the sound down and it just cuts out as you see her pass between the other runners, which have started to slow down, sensing something is very wrong. And as she runs between them, you see a cone of white mist emanate from her as she breaks the sound barrier between them and they are cast away from her like leaves on the wind. Mm. They bounce off of things. One of them lands up in the audience, uh, up in the crowds. One of them flies across the field. And the people in the front three rows of the bleachers are also thrown back fairly violently. There, Shortly after that, there are screams and the phone just becomes a jumbled mess of images as it seems to have been blown out of the hands of the person who was holding it. And the video ends. Yikes. Well, that is a problem. Well, there's more. Uh, We just got a call from uh, upstate New York, and uh, there's a very confused young athlete in a park up there who has no idea where she's at. Uh, The local officer says that he's got the situation under control for now, but that we should send someone as quickly as possible. Yeah, that local PD's got no idea who's got it on his hands. Or if he does, he's probably too scared to admit it. That is not uncommon. Okay, so we need to get upstate. I look around. You ready? Chief says, well, you got a couple options. What do you want? You want ground? Air? Air is probably going to be fastest. We can drop you off with the resources to allocate a vehicle when you get there. Yeah, let's do that. We need to get our people there and... Now, since not everybody can fly, let's uh, make sure we all go together. All right. It'll be waiting for you on the helipad on the roof. Fantastic. All right. We're wheels up in five then. Grab whatever you need. Andrew, <laughs> as he picks up his bag, adjusts his goggles. <laughs> I didn't think we'd actually be going out in the field tonight. Wow. Okay. Uh, guys, I'm going to, is there, a, I'm going to, I feel like I'm going to throw up a little bit. Let's go. And he kind of doesn't, he scurries out of the room. No, he's eager. I, uh, <laughs> I head out of the room and make towards the elevator, which will lead to the helipad. I, I yell after 
Graves. I'll be right behind you. I just have to use the restroom. And I run to the first restroom <laughs> on the way to the elevator. So I um, drop my bag that I'm holding. And I like look in the mirror and I'm like, you can do this. You can do this. This isn't like overseas. You can do this. Why did you make such an ass of yourself in front of your new CEO? Oh my God. You can do this. Are you leaning forward to talk to yourself intently in the mirror? Yes. Like I'm giving myself my own pep talk, just like my therapist taught me. Give myself my own pep talk. This isn't like overseas. You aren't going to cause a problem. It'll be fine. Nobody's going to die. Hopefully. Gents, as you head towards the elevator, you hear a, a, a strange kind of metal groaning in the pipes sound from the hallway as Riley comes shuffling out of the bathroom fairly quickly. Hey, Riley, good to go. As the door closes, you catch just a just a hint of what looks like a, a fairly large waterfall that has frozen from the tap of one of the sinks and is puddled on the floor stuff uh, some and has frozen as well. Yes, sir. I am good to go. I'm more, you know, she appears more put together now than she did about five minutes ago. Oh, yes. You can see her breath on the air. That's, by the way. Oh, okay. I, I nod, understanding that, you know, she's probably a little bit uh, anxious about what's going to go on. So you all get onto the elevator and head up to the helipad. You find a chopper on the roof, a helicopter already fueled up, the blades already starting out, and a pilot behind the stick. He gestures for you and the door opens. Another person in back wearing a Wonder Guard uniform gestures for you guys to climb in. Climb in, make sure uh, everybody's comfortable and remind them to put on the uh, harnesses because, you know, unless you can fly, super helpful to stay strapped in. Uh, Andrew buckles himself in two or three times because the first one or two don't really take. And then he finally gets it proper. He's sweating a little bit, but his, the grin hasn't left his face. He, he, he's enjoying himself, but you can tell you've seen this before. That's that kind of clown bravado. He's he's terrified right now. Sure, sure. So what I'm going to do is try to focus him up a little bit. And I'll say, all right, so what I need you to do is focus on heat trails. They're likely going to have left a fair amount of uh, ripples in the thermographic range, I would imagine. Oh, Okay, yeah, I can I can see thermal. Not a problem. Yeah, thermal's easy. He he tilts his head just a little bit. He's, there. Yeah. Okay. Just uh show me where she passed, show me where they passed by and easy peasy. Once the other two clamber onto the chopper and buckle in, the Daniel doesn't seem to be in a particular hurry. He ambles up in and I assuming lets Riley go first. Yeah. N not because he's polite, but just because she's faster. Yeah, he, he usually brings up the rear. Right. So once everyone is on, the helicopter makes that telltale whine as it powers up. The rotors really start doing their job and you lift off. For those of you who haven't spent much time in a helicopter, it's a, an odd sensation. For those of you who can fly, it's an odd sensation to be in the air and not to be directly in control of it. But you trust these pilots. They're trained by military pilots who have agreed to work with Wonder Guard. So while they are not directly militarily the military themselves now, they're not soldiers. They are trained pilots. Yeah, the main reason I'm not flying there, James, is because it would be a little unleaderly like me of to just take off and be like, hey, suckers, I'll see you when you get there. You fly for about an hour and a half. I uh, crack open a book, The History of the Polynesian War. Okay. A little LED clip light that you attached so you could read in the relative gloom of the, the helicopter. While he reads, you find Andrew and Riley and Patrick are, you find the four of you are sitting and just chatting on your way up as much as you can, you know, on a helicopter. So you have the comms and the, the headphones. The pilot tells you, we're a few minutes out from where it was reported. All right. Do we have any uh, communication link up with the local PD here that found him? Not yet. I mean, these guys are some real fifes, so there's not a lot I can do out here. I'm just hoping that we don't spook whoever it is too bad. Do you want me to bring you up short and you guys go in on foot? 
Yeah, absolutely. We don't want to land with uh, with a helicopter close by them. Got you. No ET. Let's. Get, I got you. And he he veers off to the left a little bit, and I'll get back to you as he lands the helicopter and you guys disembark and begin heading out on foot. So Chris, the question becomes. Are you the type of person who just waits for someone to come back? Or are you the type of person who takes it upon themselves to show initiative and begin hiking completely back to civilization? I start moving. I mean, I'll meet them part way, assuming that someone is coming for me. I'm, I'm if there was some sort of uh, attack by terrors uh, at the track meet, my, you know, my parents are there, team's there. Uh, I got to get back. All right. So you begin trekking your way back. You think about running, but there's two things that stop you right away. One, you don't know what just happened. And two, you, you're, you're not sure that if it, maybe what if it happens again? What if you, yeah. you pass out again? Obviously what happened or, or whatever happened, you have some sort of spell. And two, you're... You won't say exhausted, but you you definitely feel like you could eat your weight in steak and noodles. Mm -hmm. So you begin hoofing it back in the direction of the glow on the near horizon towards what looks like civilization. Yeah. Yeah. A a walk, a a steady, a steady hike. You're used to, you're used to getting up in the early mornings when you don't run, you at least go out on a hike because it builds leg muscles. It builds back muscles. It's good. Active recovery. Active recovery and cardio. So you, you're you out and heading back. The darkness on the road, you see cars occasionally pass you, but not a lot. Headlights pass fairly quickly. And uh, a helicopter goes overhead. Low enough that you can see like the, the insignia on the bottom and the call sign and such. Well, they're probably heading to the, the track meet if there was just an attack there. You would think, but it seems like they're actually heading away from civilization. Oh, huh. Maybe they're going to catch whoever did this. Possibly. Uh, It does veer off a little, and uh, after a short time, you don't hear it anymore. I just uh, keep on uh, keeping on. I mean, I I have five things I'm worried about, so. Sure, sure. So as you continue to keep on keeping on, as you are crumb your way down the road, fortitude are you going to scout the area from an eagle's eye view? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So once we get to foot, I'll inform the team that this is the basic direction I want you to continue moving. And what I'll do is through our, you know, ear radios, I'll move a bit ahead in a uh, sort of overwatch recon spot to take a look for them and try to locate that person before they become a threat or before they potentially harm themselves or others. You take to the air? Yeah. Okay. So, Granite, Viewmaster, and TBA, Frostbite. You can call me Chili, since that's what the boss said would be a good name. Chili? Chili. So, Chili, Viewmaster, and Granite? Chili, yes. I think it'd be great if she gets and sticks with the name Frostbite, but the team calls her Chili. Okay. It's not a a pet name per se, but it's more like a... Like a... It's like a term of endearment. Strategically, it also takes less time to say chili than it does to say frostbite. That's true. So yeah, I'm I'm flying over that uh that space. Okay. While the other three of you begin hoofing it, um, at a uh, well as quickly as you can go. Uh, granite, they they seem to want to move a little faster than you're usually comfortable with, but training did teach you how to go for a, a morning jog, so. Yeah, I had stamina to keep it up all day. Right. So you can, yeah, you can, they literally, they tested you. And at one point you could jog for 12 and a half hours without slowing down. So you guys head out and begin on foot. Trist, you are heading around a corner, coming around a corner. And the, there's the sound of, you know, various woodland undergrowth creatures and such. Probably a deer or whatever, but not, you haven't seen a car in a good 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Out of, uh, uh, so so. how do you handle this fortitude? How do you, how do you handle uh, your appearance? You see, the, it's gotta be the, it's gotta be the person. It's the only person out here walking on the road. Yeah, I would probably land, I would say 
no closer than 30 meters away, like a good 100 feet. When you land, is it a hard land or a soft land? Do you do the hero landing or is it more of a uh, Alex Ross drift to the earth? I, I Alex Ross drift to the earth because there is no, there's nothing that can be gained from hard landing on earth next to someone that's just erupted. <laughs> and it's hard on the knees. I mean, I, to be fair, Graves doesn't have to worry about that. No, that's true. You drift more Alex Ross style, so you drift down to the earth more gently. Trist, a humanoid figure comes down out of the sky at a slower rate than falling, a much slower rate than falling, and alights on the ground in front of you about, would you say, Mike, about 30 meters? Yeah, roughly. I, I would I mean, it would be within visual range, but I'm... Okay, so uh, down the road a ways. Do you also have a light on you of some sort? I do. Well, I, not only okay. that, but Graves' flight leaves the we will just call it the Jack Kirby Trail. The Jack Kirby Trail. <laughs> it, it leaves a, yeah, it leaves a almost a, a negative energy in the air with small, you can't tell if they're circles or spheres or what shape they are. They leave a, 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 a series of, of dissipating energy spheres behind him that, that collapse upon themselves as he passes. Do I recognize him? I mean, with him being as famous as he is. Are you a fan of the Wonders and Wonder Guard? Do you check like the websites? Do you watch late night TV? I mean, I don't think I'm a super fan because um, I mean, I'm an NYU student. I'm spending a lot of time in books, track. That takes a lot of my time. But if he's popular enough, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the popular culture of the time. Give me a cunning culture role. I don't live in uh, a cave somewhere. I am a college <laughs> student. Two, culture, and three, cunning. Eights and above are successes. In the aberrant system, uh, seven and above are is the target. Well, thank goodness, because that gives me two successes then. Awesome. So, yes, for wonders, or in the base system, as they're referred to as novas, in our world, they're referred to as wonders. Wonders, they're, yeah, their target number is always going to be seven. So unless I say something else or conditions are very strange, your target number will always be seven. Perfect. I have two successes then, two sevens. As he lands, it takes you a moment because it's not that you don't recognize him. It's that it can't be him. Like, why would Fortitude, who you have seen on WTMC, you have seen on YouTube, why would he be here? Especially landing in front of you. Yeah. Holy, holy shit, Fortitude, is that you? I, I keep my... I keep a reasonable pace, right? Um, I keep walking towards this person and uh, sort of slowly not put my hands up, per se, but I have them out at my side. I visually show that I'm not carrying any weapons and I'm generally sort of, I have an affable nature about me. Fortune, if you're here to help, the, the, uh, the school's that way. Something happened there. We gotta, we gotta get there. I mean, you could, we, you could fly me there. Some of my parents are there. Uh, I, I, I don't even, I don't even really remember what happened. But I'm here, and so, uh, the, uh, I think police said I maybe exploded here. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> I keep moving towards her. Um, I'm, I slow pace a little bit as I get closer. I probably keep a good, we'll just say three meters of distance between me and her physically. You're staying um, defensive, but not openly defensive, as in like you're expecting her to explode. You're more of just a cautious, friendly, like, hey, let's talk. <laughs> but at some no. point, like, she might notice that I'm clearly not getting too close to her. No, we can't. We can't say. We can't say here and talk. We gotta go. My pa my parents could be hurt. You know who I am. Well, yeah. I, everyone knows who you are. Your fortitude. I'm not here because of the school. I'm here because of you. Fortitude. Make me a intellect medicine roll. Okay. She is uh, on the base level of it. She is in shock right now. Right. Her body has just consumed a massive amount of energy, and uh, it. it 
it's you know that that's not uncommon, especially the disorientation, the shock. Okay. So I'm going to step a little closer because obviously she's gone to try to expel a lot of the whatever's left inside inside of her. When you approach her completely, you also notice that in her shock, she has not noticed that she is no longer wearing shoes. Mm. She is barefoot. The very bottoms of her feet have developed this darker... It's not exactly a callus, but it seems to have developed almost a, a meta material, and that there are green veins of just very faint crackling energy up her legs from the bottoms of her feet up her calves. Yeah, I'm imagining her um, hamstrings and glutes are going to hurt like hell tomorrow. Absolutely. You can see them. They're, they're glowing slightly. Uh, so, uh, what? I'm sorry. You are... Uh, uh, Trist, uh, Trist Waring. I, I run, I, I, I run track for NYU. Yeah, yeah, and you, you do. Uh, so listen. <laughs> the other three arrive right about now. You guys, uh, um, Riley and Daniel and Andrew behind are now arriving at a jog. Um, Andrew and Riley are slightly winded. Granite. Not so much. No, Daniel, not so much. I'm going to uh, attempt, anyway, to um, continue to call calm Trist down um, with, um, well, let's just say some, some simple understanding, which is the, the people at the school are going to be okay. There, there's emergency services dealing with them right now. What you and I have to come to an understanding about is that you were running track there. And you are now here, which is why I'm here. What do you, what do you mean? Me? I couldn't have, I mean, I, I couldn't have ran all the way out here. You know, under normal circumstances, that's correct. But under extraordinary circumstances, one might say wondrous circumstances, you could. I think this might be a good point for Tris to like look down and finally see her legs slightly glowing. Yep. Like she hadn't noticed it yet. And now that like things are kind of coming to and I've expelled whatever exhaustion and lunch was inside me. And now that you're actually looking at them, you realize there are small, not veins, but they look a little bit like veins with this, this pulsating green energy and your, your Achilles tendon and your, your calves have these all the way up the backs of your legs. Yeah. If Tris wasn't already doubled over from puking, she would fully collapse. But she just kind of goes, like sits back, knees bent, elbows on knees, head in hands and goes, I want to say completely into shock because pretty much every, if this is true, every aspiration that I have, what I've been working for is gone. Like I'm not, I'm not going to the Olympics I'm not going to be running track anymore. Yeah, every, everything that I have is gone. So having having some sense of that, given that she's an athlete and given that she's now a wonder, I think that's what I'm going to do as far as trying to, to use a, a sort of calming presence on her, even in, <laughs> as she's sort of doubling over into catatonic state and use it as an example to the team of how try to talk people into getting out of the space that they're in and back to a facility so they don't hurt anyone or themselves. Andrew is, he takes, he's staying outer towards the outer edge of, of the group of you and he takes his goggles off and he's looking up and down the road and across the countryside. Um, He seems to be checking things, letting you guys do your thing. He kind of mumbles to Riley. I, I'm not really comfortable with this with this part. I'm gonna. I'll be over here. She just kind of glances over at him as they were jogging over. She had taken her gloves off and put them in her back pocket of her of her outfit, just in case some additional assistance was needed. Okay, you are crouched down next to next to Trist their fortitude when frostbite and granite show up trist you see through the just flow of tears 
and the the, the kaleidoscope of of things that are cascading through your brain as your brain desperately tries to find something solid to cling to right now because everything that you would have co- used to think about to cope with before is now part of the problem. You can't think about track. You can't think about your parents because they might be injured. You can't think about school because you just blew it up and uh, these other two walk up towards you. You don't recognize them as much. They are both wearing Wonder Guard t-shirts though. Granite is wearing a t-shirt. Frostbite is wearing a, it's made of a kind of like a lycra, kind of like a, 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 it's, it's hard to define fabric, but it was given to you special at your training facility. Supposed to work well in sub-zero temperatures without breaking like most fabrics do. That's good. We don't need her running around naked. As you are comforting the young athlete, Andrew pipes up. Uh, uh, boss, uh, uh, sir. Yeah, what is it? There's, there's, there's people coming. Uh, you see him. Uh, he leans forward and squints a little bit. His goggles are up on the top of his head. As he squints, various shades of very faint shades of light emanate from his eyes, which are about twenty five percent larger than a normal person's eyes. They are, they are noticeably larger, mm. and they don't. The eyeballs themselves don't seem to be comprised of the same parts that other people's eyes are. Mm-hmm. And he, he he's shifty. You can see the, sh- the colors that are emanating from the eyes balls themselves are shifting very slightly. And he says, "Yeah, there's there's a couple of there's a couple of a couple of vehicles coming, a couple of big ones, and they're coming in fast, like way above the speed limit." He looks towards civilization. Okay, uh, so I will get in my earpiece and ask the radio op- or the, the helicopter operator to advise on the incoming that we have, if at all possible. And then I'll probably turn to Granite and say, we don't know who that is. Block the road. Nobody gets in. Got it, boss. You start heading further up the road? Yeah, then I'll shift. You see the helicopter, you hear the helicopter whine and power up and take to the air. Takes just a moment, as you don't think he actually left the engines. He didn't turn them all the way off. He was just kind of in idle, you know, letting it continue to spin. Mm-hmm. He says, uh, you know, info ETA as soon as I get it. Sure, sure. Riley, you're back up. So give us about 10, 15 yards out. Anybody gets past granite for whatever reason. Reason in place. Yes, sir. I trot over past them. I will turn back to Trist and say, there's a lot of people that are going to ask a lot of questions. And the guard can help you find the answers that you might need about yourself and about what's happening. So as he's saying this, you see Granite run up the road. Granite, are you fully shifting? Yes. Okay. Okay. So you guys hear his footsteps go from thip, thip, thip to thush, dun, 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 as they impact the, the pavement. And sink slightly. Yep, and sink slightly in with each footstep. You run up the road away from the group. This is the part that you actually have come to really enjoy, the, in training that you really enjoyed. You're pretty sure that you've got this ahead of you. Roaring up the road is a large hill folk pickup truck. It has the silver roll bars and the many lights across the top. You can see pieces of cloth fluttering from the top. You can't see what's on them, but you can almost guarantee it's not something you want to read. There's two other vehicles behind them. One is a uh, is an SUV, and the other one is looks like a cargo van. One of the old white cargo vans and something is spray-painted on the side of it. Um, It looks like a cross made of two crossing pieces of DNA, crudely painted. Um, The pickup truck just barreling towards you. Are you going to give them a chance to stop, or are you just going to stop them as you have trained? I'm going to stop them. 
All right. You are going to utilize your ability, I assume? Yes. All right. So this is your... Density. Density. All right. In this case, what I need you to do is roll your quantum pool, the number of dots you have in your quantum pool, plus the number of dots you are activating of your density. All right. It's four and four. Now, remember for you also have to spend, I believe it's your activation cost, which is... I believe it's, I believe it's four uh, quantum. How many successes did you get? Five. Five. And you spend your four quantum points yes. from your pool. So with five successes, you feel your, your feet sink into the asphalt with those last two steps as the truck is heading towards you you feel your hands firmly grab the front uh, exaggerated uh, chrome grill bar and the rest of you can hear a violent car accident not far from you and see the headlights of this truck go askew and then go out as it hits something it sounds like it wraps itself around a tree in a very real way, granite, it wraps itself around something much denser than a tree. Mm-hmm. It wraps itself around you. You feel the engine compartment as this and the steel of this of this front end of this truck wrap around you, and you hear things break and shatter around you as the truck just goes to pieces. You do feel the force of it, of course, but it doesn't hurt. You're stoned as it crashes around you. The other two vehicles come to a screeching halt, a literal screeching halt. The cargo doors open and mm, skeevy looking men step out with weapons pointed and men from the SUV do the same. They don't seem to be interested in talking. They just seem to be interested in perhaps taking one of you or maybe just putting you down. It's hard to say, but I think that is a fantastic thing to find out next episode. So thank all of you for joining me for the first episode of our Aberrant series. And I know I'm enjoying it so far. I hope you are too. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic night.